Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're going to be discussing the biosynthesis of the sex steroids, mainly testosterone and estradiol. Now, before we get too deep into the biosynthesis of the sex steroids, like testosterone and estradiol, I think it's important that we go back in particular to this slide right here from the previous video and review a few big important concepts, which will in some form or fashion come back to bite us in this topic here. So on this slide in the previous video, we discussed the biosynthesis of aldosterone, our primary mineral out of corticoid, and cortisol, the primary glucocorticoid in humans. And recall that this enzyme right here, 17-alpha-hydroxylase, is a really important enzyme because what it does is it determines ultimately whether we're going to be making aldosterone or at the very least cortisol. If you look at this enzyme, its reaction, it takes this position, which is the 17 position, and it hydroxylates it. You can see here pregnenolone gets hydroxylated at this position and becomes 17-alpha-hydroxypregnenolone. Also, progesterone can be acted on by 17-alpha-hydroxylase at the same position, and you get 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone. 17-alpha-hydroxylase is an irreversible reaction. So once these two molecules are converted into their 17-alpha-hydroxy derivatives, these molecules can no longer become aldosterone. They're committed to, at the very minimum, becoming cortisol. These two enzymes over here, 21-hydroxylase and 11-beta-hydroxylase, which are both upregulated by ACTH, they can then generate cortisol which is then dumped into the blood and then acts as a major regulator of metabolism, particularly of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Now coming back over here, the 17-alpha-hydroxylase. This enzyme, as we know right now, is a major committed step in going from synthesis of mineralocorticoids to glucocorticoids like cortisol. But its function is a lot more profound. So it turns out that 17-alpha-hydroxylase is part of a multifunctional enzyme. And depending on the state of that enzyme, it can act as, let's say, a 17-alpha-hydroxylase to turn pregnenolone and progesterone into their 17-alpha-hydroxy derivatives. Or it can function entirely differently and direct the steroid into sex steroid synthesis. Let's go to that. So just to orient you with this figure, I've shifted everything vertically upwards. So you can see here these two down arrows on the left. These are both 17-alpha-hydroxylase from the previous video. And we can see the conversion of pregnenolone and progesterone to their 17-alpha-hydroxy derivatives. And then on the right, we see the creation of cortisol via 21-hydroxylase and 11-beta-hydroxylase. Now, I mentioned that the 17-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme was part of a multifunctional enzyme. And the multifunctional enzyme is CYP17A1, or CYP17A1. This is one of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And depending on the state of this enzyme, it has two entirely different functions. So if we take CYP17A1 and we phosphorylate it at a particular site, and then we throw on this giant coenzyme, cytochrome B5, it actually functions as a 1720 lyase. More on that in just a couple minutes. If we remove the phosphoryl group, so dephosphorylate it, and we remove the cytochrome B5, it now functions as a 17-alpha hydroxylase. So the control over which action this multifunctional enzyme has depends on is it phosphorylated and does it have the cytochrome B5? And if both of those answers are yes, it's a 1720 lyase. If the answer to both of those is no, it's a 17 alpha hydroxylase. So, in order to synthesize cortisol, that CYP17A1 enzyme better be dephosphorylated and it should not have the cytochrome B5 cofactor. And as long as those things are the case, that enzyme will only function as a 17-alpha-hydroxylase, which will give us the 17-alpha-hydroxy derivatives of pregnenolone and progesterone, and then we can create cortisol via this reaction sequence. However, if we take CYP17A1 and we phosphorylate it at a particular site and we add that cytochrome B5 cofactor, well now we're also going to have this 1720 lyase activity. Now don't think it's 100% 1720 lyase. 
we have to have some 17 alpha hydroxylase activity. But then we will also have the 1720 lyase activity, which will convert 17 alpha hydroxypregnenolone and 17 alpha hydroxyprogesterone into dehydroepiandrosterone or DHEA and androstenedione. So if we have CYP17A1 phosphorylated and the cytochrome B5, we now have an active 1720 lyase, and that is the committed step into sex steroid synthesis. Because notice what this enzyme does, is it cleaves off this carbonyl group and essentially oxidizes this hydroxyl group right here into a carbonyl. So it just takes off this short little carbon chain. That's an irreversible reaction. Once you do that, these two molecules can no longer be converted to cholesterol. You are now with DHEA and androstenedione, and you are committed to sex steroid synthesis. Now, you can interconvert between DHEA and androstenedione, right? You can use this enzyme, which we saw in the previous video, 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which acts right here between this hydroxyl group and this double bond, essentially moving that double bond around and creating a carbonyl right here. Okay, so you can interconvert between these. But at this point now, we are committed to sex steroid synthesis. And the first one that's gonna be created is testosterone. So going a little further, if we take dehydroepiandrosterone and we react it with 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, that will take this carbonyl up here and convert it into a hydroxyl group. And then if we take androstenedione, again, and react it with 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, again, it will take this carbonyl and reduce that into a hydroxyl group. And right here, you have testosterone. If we react the 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase with DHEA, that will give us androstenediol, which can then be converted into testosterone via this 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which essentially takes this double bond, this hydroxyl group, and oxidizes it into this form that you see right here. That is testosterone. So at this point, you might be thinking the following. Okay, I get it. The CYP17A1 enzyme is a multifunctional enzyme, and depending on its state, it either allows us to generate cortisol or the 1720 lyase activity takes over, and now we're committed to sex steroids. But some cells generally make sex steroids, and some make cortisol. What is it that makes up that difference? Well, it's all about gene expression. So if we go back to this picture right here, recall that cortisol and other glucocorticoids, minor ones in humans at least, are made primarily in the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex. So in order to make cortisol, we shouldn't have that 1720 lyase activity. It should function primarily as only a 17 alpha hydroxylase. So in this zone of the, of the adrenal cortex, we're not gonna have very much of that cytochrome B5, and we're also gonna have very low activity of that kinase that phosphorylates CYP17A1. So therefore, it's gonna be functioning mainly as a 17-alpha hydroxylase. Whereas if we go to the zona reticulata of the adrenal cortex or the gonads that also manufacture these sex steroids, they're gonna have much higher concentrations of that cytochrome B5 and much higher activity of the kinase that phosphorylates CYP17A1, thus turning it into a 1720 lyase. So it's all about the expression of cytochrome B5 and also the activity of that particular kinase that's going to dictate which branch of steroids you're going to make. And that's why we have this division of labor within the adrenal cortex and within other tissues like the gonads. So now at this point, we've got testosterone. This synthesis of testosterone, as I've shown it, occurs in males. It also occurs in females. It's just what happens to the testosterone from here on that determines the physiology and the overall effects. It's certainly possible that testosterone, as it is, could just be dumped into the blood bound to a carrier protein, be delivered to a particular cell, diffuse into the cell, and bind to androgen receptors within the cytoplasm, and now you've got androgenic effects on that cell. That's very possible. But in certain tissues, like the epididymis, the seminal vesicles, the prostate, which are in males, 
Testosterone can be converted to dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And this occurs via the action of this enzyme 5-alpha reductase. You can see here that it takes this double bond and completely reduces that. And that little reduction right there is enough to increase the potency of the molecule by five to 10 times. In other words, DHT is over five times as potent of an androgen as testosterone. Very interesting stuff. Now, the testosterone is required to make estrogens. Now, estrogen, that is not a molecule. Estrogen is a class of molecules, but that term is frequently thrown around as if it is a molecule. So now we're gonna get into the synthesis of the estrogens. And that is via this enzyme called aromatase. Once aromatase acts on any of these molecules, it is now committed to being an estrogen. Now, males have a little bit of this aromatase, so they do make a little bit of estrogens. But females, biological females, tend to have a significantly higher amount and activity of this enzyme aromatase. So any of these molecules that are made, androstenedione, testosterone, there is a little bit of them that you will find in the blood of females. However, a significant percentage of these molecules are converted to their estrogen derivatives via aromatase. And you can see molecularly speaking, it basically takes this first ring right here, this is ring A of the steroid, and it aromatizes it with this little hydroxyl group right here. So androstenedione is converted to estrone, and testosterone is converted to the most well-known estrogen, which is estradiol, okay? And of course, estradiol is made primarily in the ovaries, and there's a few other tissues as well. And we can get into the functions of that in a lot of detail in other videos. Same thing with testosterone. But the big point here is that in order to make the estrogens, you actually have to first make the androgens. And then it's just what happens to the androgens that determines the overall physiology, the overall effect. Now you can also see here that estrone and estradiol can be interconverted via the 17-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, but between these two, the one with the most estrogenic activity, the strongest one, is estradiol. Now there is one more conversion that can happen, and that is via this enzyme, CYP3A4, aka 16-alpha hydroxylase. This takes estradiol and hydroxylates this position right here. You can see the alpha hydroxyl group that's added, and this molecule is called estriol. Now, if you are not pregnant, the levels of estriol in the blood will be negligible. There is a little bit, but it's negligible. Once you're pregnant at certain points, the estriol concentration goes sharply up. And to be honest with you, I don't know that they know the exact function of the estriol. Perhaps it has some interplay with the pregnancy, with the developing fetus. Um, it could just be a metabolic waste product, a way to inactivate or, or partially deactivate the estradiol. They don't know the exact function, but that conversion does happen. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the biosynthesis of the sex steroids, in particular testosterone and estradiol. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.